Okay. I hope everybody is uh, doing well. Um, this is Dave Lundahl. I'm uh, going to start the uh, this version of webinars now on an extremely exciting topic uh, today on innovation, uh, accelerating innovation through the agile sort of techniques. This is a part one of a part two series. Part one is going to be focused on the front end of the innovation, uh, clearing up the front end. So I'm here with uh, Karen Lynch, and um, I'm still waiting for her to join us. Uh, Karen, uh, I'm not hearing you, so I'm just going to start going, continue, and hopefully you're going to uh, be able to um, join in so we can hear you as well. So anyways, um, uh, a little bit about um, insights now before we get started for those of you who uh, have not had a chance to know much about Insights Now or work with Insights Now in the past. Um, and uh, so as Dave Lundahl, I've uh, been working uh, in the innovation space for about 25 years. I founded Insights Now in 2003, uh, published a book in 2011 on innovation. And it was called Breakthrough Food Product Innovation Through Emotions Research. Uh, Karen Lynch is our Senior Director of Qualitative Insights. Uh, she's been a seasoned uh, a qualitative researcher for over 25 years in the industry. Uh, just a great person to work with, very knowledgeable about innovation. She's a trustee on the board for the Creative Education Foundation. Uh, and, she, and she heads up, as I said, her our qualitative practice. Uh, she's a, a great moderator. Uh, she's a moderator that knows a lot about brands, a lot, of, a lot about products, which is uh, not all moderators are really steeped in those sort of moderation uh, types of uh, methodologies. And uh, so she's also extremely excited about this topic. Uh, Insights Now, uh, we are a behavioral market research company. We focus our efforts in supporting companies in three ways. One is in innovation, product development. The second is brand positioning, planning. And the third is marketing and messaging, especially uh, this digital age, digital marketing. Sort of our motto, one of the things that we look at the world at is we believe that if we could change the way we look at people and why products succeed or don't succeed, this sort of lens into people is will help us improve the speed to and success in market. So it's very much involved in the whole area of innovation. Uh, we have, for this perspective, one, a lot of recognition in the industry. Uh, most recently won the Change Agent of the Year this past fall by Next Gen Market Research and Women in Research. Uh, we are currently on the GRIT uh, top 50 list as some of the more innovative uh, companies in the world, and uh, and so on. So uh, we work in the Institute of Technology. We work with sensory professionals, Insights Association, um, SMR, a number of other uh, groups. All right. So um, I am trying to get Karen here. So she is now unmuted. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yay. Right. <laughs> I've been here just, just in various mute places. So uh, <laughs> anyway, hi everybody. Right. I'm happy to be here. Dave, just continue. <laughs> yeah, okay. We're gonna um so just as a couple things for those of you that have never been involved in some of our past webinars, we try to make this something that's very interactive. If you have a question, you can enter your questions here on this side panel you have. Uh, if you want to um, make a question to be uh, private to us, then we will follow up with you. If you want to send it to all, then we will address your question at the end of this webinar. And you can type it in at any point during this. Uh, this helps us sort of understand things. I see that a few of you are, um, are see questions. At the start, I do not hear the speaker. I'm in listening only mode. That's okay. 
um, and so on. So uh, this is going to be about a half an hour sort of presentation and discussion. Uh, discussion could go a little longer than that. All right, so hopefully that's addressed any of the questions that you all may have at this point. Uh, if you're having trouble hearing, um, try calming, you know, connecting back in, uh, if that's going to be helpful. All right, so let's get into the content here. Five years ago, we sent out a survey to the uh, to contacts that we had in uh, industries, fast-moving consumer goods, and we found that the greatest challenges for innovation were in four buckets. The first is the idea of opportunities were lost in translation between a good concept and designing and developing the product that fit that concept. There was a lot of frustration that we heard, both on the marketing side and the R&D side, about unalignment. We also heard a lot of frustration about lack of knowledge for good decision making. And we also heard, this is five years ago, a lot of issues about working within a risk avoidance culture. Now, not a lot has changed in the last five years, but what has changed is that this classical approach to innovation is no longer working. That is, this sort of linear process of stages and gates is not really fitting the times. Uh, once upon a time, <laughs> five years ago or longer, you know, brands really uh, were the trendsetters. Consumers were relatively static. Uh, there weren't that many true competitors for a lot of companies. Uh, usually big spending on TV and traditional tra channels drove awareness and influenced purchase behavior. And so companies were able to, when this sort of methodology was first developed back in the 1990s, it was something that worked. And it was long innovation cycles, usually 18 months to two years for most companies. Today, things have changed. Companies have found that a new approach needs to be, uh, you know, uh, this sort of statement uh, that I recently found from Hinkle Beauty Care suggests that they have taken an approach where they combine the scale, professionalism, and expertise of a huge multinational company with the agility, accessibility, and entrepreneurship of a startup, and that's very different uh, because the world is not brand driven anymore, it's digitally driven, where brands now are following the trends and the fads. Uh, consumers are much less loyal. You know, digital media has created a huge landscape, competitive landscape for companies to work in and challenges thereof. Uh, consumers are seeking products that fit their lifestyles, attitudes, beliefs, and so on. Um, you know, uh, in terms of marketing, consumers are much more influenced by something they'll see on a YouTube video than a TV celebrity on TV um, supporting a brand. So things are very much different today. So what has been replacing this linear process is an agile process. And it Agile processes tend to be viewed as iterative learning sprints. That means each learning sprint goes through a process of discovery, uh, some sort of inspiration, decision on various actions to take, and some sort of testing or gaining of consumer feedback. From the early front end all the way the, to the back end, you move from identifying ideas um, identifying moments, which we'll be talking about here in a bit, to identifying uh, design features and qualities of products and bringing them out to market. So, so this sort of process is aligned with the startup thinking. It's very up entrepreneurial. You start with small bets. You either fail fast or you evolve it. You know, these learning sprints basically align the spending that companies can have with increased confidence through various different iterations here that they will be successful. So aligning a risk and a reward. 
the result of this, companies are finding is they can dramatically increase their success rates by also reducing their time to market. And these dramatic numbers, it's, it's uh, really changing the whole world. So today we're going to be focused on the very first iterative learning sprint, which is the fuzzy front end and how to gain clarity into it. Okay. So let's focus. We're going to go through some sort of high-level things, and then Karen is going to come in with some really tangible nuts and bolts types of case studies uh, to ex show some examples of how this is done. So how do we clear up the fuzzy front end? Well, it starts really with the team, the innovation team, and the type of knowledge that the people have in this team. And I'm sure all of you who work on uh, for large companies, you can relate to this, is that you're probably put into various innovation teams that may have business managers that are really thinking about the business objectives uh, for a brand uh, for or for various different business units. You have marketing researchers, which have a different set of sort of expertise in social psychology or cultural and anthropology, behavioral economics maybe. You have sensory researchers that really understand product and uh, perception. You have innovators such as uh, food designers or our creative uh, designers of various, you know, that are really understand the idea of how to design and, and translate things. So uh, this, but the starting point for all of these innovation teams and for all of you, I think when you're in an innovation process is really understanding what are your business objectives and requirements? Uh, what is the existing knowledge that you have as a team? So if this is a far out, you know, uh, sort of uh, initiative where you're really focusing on doing something very innovative, your knowledge may, or in an area um, of the marketplace you haven't played before, either you may not have that much knowledge or you may have a tremendous knowledge, but understanding where you stand as a team is important so that in the first learning sprint, you can focus on discovering opportunities to gain inspiration, that is what to do, to generate the ideas, that is how to do it, and then to gain feedback from consumers on those ideas. That's the first iterative learning sprint. That's the fuzzy front end, gaining clarity into it. Now, we have found that the, to have success especially in discovery, where research really comes into play a lot, it is the understanding of moments that is so important. Because moments of people's lives are what add context, and context is extremely important to what people do and why they do it. So, so moments impact behavior more than any other sort of dimension of, of behavioral science uh, that there is. So in the discovery part of this iteration, the questions are, what are the relative moments that are and relevant for consumer and relevant for your brand or your initiative? And then within these moments, what are the behaviors and in particular, why do people do what they do? Why these behaviors? All right. So, for instance, if, you know, um, consider the moments of your life. Uh, and think about my life as well, where various products and brands are really relevant. What are the behaviors of a household cleanser moment? What are the considerations that you might use for various different job that you're going to do. Um, so why might you choose one product or another? It may be that the product chosen is not even viewed as the same category as you may think. Um, same goes with, uh, you know, for a snack food. You know, what is the difference in terms of behavior for when you're trying to replace a meal or uh, with the product, and perhaps when you're going to have one of these secret indulgences late at night for a snack food, 
Why would you choose one product or another? What is that behavior like? What is it that, uh, what is the, 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 the sort of reasons for, the whys of why you choose one product or another? These are really important. Now, beauty care products, for instance, you know, what are, what are it that you're seeking in, say, a facial cleanser? What is it you're seeking or what might be the fears of the various ingredients that you would put on your face in some moment? You know, these are all important questions to delve into to understand at the front end of the innovation process. So what we have, um, and Karen is going to go through some of these and how this makes uh, sense in examples. But what we do is we focus on building knowledge at the front end, the fuzzy front end, in terms of understanding journeys. That is, what are the journeys that people go through um, that are relevant to the brand, relevant to the initiative, your, your innovation initiative? And it could be aligning shopping with consumption moments. There are very different types of moments, uh, but each journeys, people step through these various different moments. Within a moment, who are people with? Who are you with? Where is this? Uh, what are your typical habits and routines uh, within these moments? Um, and so what are the cues and what are the signals of products, brand names, packaging, features? What is it about products that signal what the benefits are or signal the consequences that people are fearful about. These are relevant ways to think about things behavioral at the front end of the innovation process. Rather than looking at product white space, what you want to do is find behavioral white space. Places where people's habits and routines are uh, can be disrupted in ways that they create opportunities for your brand or for your initiative. But having knowledge and moments at the front end of innovation is not enough. What you do need is inspiration. You need to be able to inspire, be inspired by this knowledge so that you know what are the greatest opportunities for your brand or for your initiative and to know how to influence the various behavioral outcomes in terms of what people are going to use in various moments. So it's really important that we get to a process of inspiration. And some of the the, the uh, case studies that Karen's going to show here in a little bit will be focusing on some methods and techniques to gain that inspiration for teams. Now, to gain knowledge, to know how to impact consumers behaviorally, you know, you need to really understand what people do. And one of the really interesting things that we have found is the fact that the average decision to select some sort of fast-moving consumer good from a grocery store shelf is under five seconds. Now, that's very fast. So part of the understanding is why. Why people do what they do is understanding the type of thinking that they use in making decisions like this. So fast decisions are really part of routine moments. Think about if you're at a grocery store or some store buying some various different product. It could be a drug store, or it could be whatever. You know, if you're there often, you know, you have a routine. You're going to go down a certain aisle. You're going to be selecting certain products from your list. Often, these are very routine, and they happen very quick. These are unimportant, fairly mundane decisions that don't have consequences uh, for people. They're just part of what you do when you're doing a shopping sort of, you're uh, going through a shopping uh, time. So. However, there are situations where consumers are disrupted out of their habits and routines, and these are often the greatest moments of opportunity to understand this. So these sort of points of disruption where someone moves from fast thinking into slow thinking, 
Okay, fast thinking or system one thinking to slow thinking or some people call system two thinking. And these are, are sort of reserved for moments where you're in a new situation, maybe in a new store. You're considering a different moment of use that is atypical for you. It could be that you have a health concern that you didn't have. You've had a lifestyle change that you didn't have before. Um, it could be that you're exposed to a new idea uh, that you saw through some person that told or something on the internet, whatever, um, or you're exposed to something you had not seen on a store shelf before, uh, a new product to try. Or it could be that you're faced with some new important decision, you're you're um, going to be cooking for friends that are coming over, and you're thinking about what to use. You know, it's important to to be able to have something that your guests in your home would really like. So, so these moments of disruption are very different. They create moments of opportunity for brands or initiatives. Now, once you've actually been able to be inspired then it's really a decision about what actions to take. So what are the biggest and best ideas to move forward? How to influence behavioral change uh, with these ideas? So at every point of this process in the fuzzy front end, think about what the behavioral impact may be. And last but not least, knowing how to take action does not complete the iterative cycle of a learning sprint. You must also gain feedback from consumers to validate whether or whether or not your ideas will achieve the behavioral impact that you seek. So this is why the fastest learning cycles are the ones that involve co-creation within the innovation team, bringing in consumers interactively to both generate and test and gain feedback to ideas simultaneously or iteratively in some sort of rapid fashion. So that's sort of some background or context, some ideas to think about. I'm going to turn it over now to Karen, and let's go through some case studies. All right. And Dave, just double-checking, you can hear my audio, correct? Yes. <laughs> Yay, it's a win. Yay. <laughs> All right. Yay. Thank you so much. So what I want to do is start off with just some recent innovations, but recent innovations that feel inspired, if you will. Um, if you want to go right to the next slide, Dave, there's some literally this year, some, some, some breakthrough innovations, at least one that I want to share with you, and then some others that are happening in the next few months and some that happen incrementally over time. If you look at this uh, slide from left to right here, a real breakthrough is what Neutrogena did last year when they had a totally new approach to helping acne sufferers. They brought to market a light therapy acne mask. So this was wearable, it was reusable, it utilized light wavelengths to totally disrupt the acne cycle and also disrupt the category. That's real breakthrough transformational innovation where it's something completely different from what currently exists. Now, GIF, this, you know, infamous peanut butter brand, this May is entering a new category, launching these GIF power-ups. So they're entering the snack category beyond just, you know, where they've always lived in peanut butter, very, very well known. They're now going into a new category. They're stretching their existing brand's identity and moving into a different field. So it's another, uh, another example of an innovation that, that's uh, more of a stretch for the brand. The Monster brand is moving into coffee beverages. So they launched Espresso Monster uh, at the end of last year, and they're introducing Cafe Monster this quarter, actually. So classic line extensions kind of taking taking more of a route in the beverage industry, but staying within or within the beverage category, but staying within the category. And then, of course, incremental up, updates or incremental improved improvements. The, the Apple updates are an idea of that. Like they have to make changes. They have to improve. So those are innovations of some sort, but they're on the smaller uh, incremental side. 
The red circle around breakthrough and transformational new product innovation and new category information, that's really where the emphasis on uh, fuzzy front end research and um, inspirational efforts can take place. So kind of if you're thinking about doing those sorts of things, we really need to rely on some methodologies to help you get inspired to bring some new products to market. Let me show you a little bit about what this looks like. Some of you, if not all of you, are likely familiar with the Swiffer story. I'm going to start there just because it's worth repeating. It's brilliant in terms of what we can learn from it. It required a significant amount of knowledge gathering. Okay, so they were uh, the design agency for P&G was watching, you know, hours and hours of ethnographic videotape footage and learning how people mop. They really had to understand how people were caring for their floors in their in their kitchens in their homes. And it took this one quintessential famous moment now of an elderly woman who, after she was done, leaned down with a damp paper towel to get the rest of the fine dust. And that's what led to the aha. That wet paper towel to get the last remaining bits of dust led to this aha. That led to product design for the Swiffer, um, the Swiffer ingenious creation, if you will. So now while you have that moment of inspiration where you've gathered some knowledge and you've had this aha moment, lots of companies are also relying on applying their imagination. So this image here on the upper right is actually an image of Google's innovation lab. You know, Deloitte has an innovation lab, PepsiCo has an innovation lab, lots of companies around the world have innovation labs where they're using processes to create an environment that is conducive to creativity, to problem solving, for creative problem solving, if you will, bringing in methodologies and bringing in tools of the trade like post-it notes and Sharpies and bright colors and comfortable seating with the goal of applying imagination and some of the precepts of deliberate creativity and creative methods to the knowledge that they've gained through consumer research and insight, putting those two things together for their innovation efforts. So we work in both of those ways here, and I'll, I'll show you how we've woven them into two specific methodologies, but it's the idea of consumer research, where we get some insights, and facilitated ideation or brainstorming, where we can take some of that knowledge that we've gained on behaviors and moments, and we can look at everything that we've uncovered about why people do what they do, but also gain some momentum for ideation and for concept development and take it forward. Let's start with the first case study. So this is some work that we did in the instant coffee category. Okay, we're talking about clarifying the fuzzy front end again. And one of the things when you're trying to discover opportunities is you really do need to do category exploratory, especially if you're going into a new category. You have to understand what is happening currently. And I can tell you the categories are changing rapidly, just as our workplaces are changing rapidly. So if you are like, oh yeah, five years ago we did a category exploratory, most likely things have changed in that category. You need to know what's present and current in wherever you're looking to venture. So here again, in the instant coffee category, we wanted to take a look um, about you know what was happening in in a cu typical customer journey, but we actually flipped that on on its head. I'll tell you in a minute what we did. But the spoiler alert is that we didn't look at it from the consumer's point of view. We looked at it actually from the container's point of view. What was a day in the life of an instant coffee container? Let me tell you about the design. We conducted an online ethnography project. And that's, you know, real immersive research with a wide range of activities. Many of you are probably quite familiar with, you know, online research at this point and how we can incorporate mobile. But the idea is that we want to really get deep into consumers' lives. It's the perfect platform, actually, for customer journey work, where we're capturing experiences, emotions. We're talking about usage occasions and the feelings around them. But we're looking for that behavioral intersection, right, of where we're pairing kind of the behavior in a given moment to tell a story. So we're looking for the story behind that behavior, what's motivating people in that moment of either purchase or use. And we also really engage consumers to make it sort of a fun and unique 
experience for them. And, and part of that is because we want to we want to take some momentum and get that inspiration to move into the next iteration, which might be ideation. Well, let me tell you a little bit more about what the methodology looks like. We journaled some moments of consumption. We shared videos of usage and photos of storage. And again, we looked at this as if it were the container that was being, you know, the, the container's life that was being mapped out, if you will. Obviously, as with a lot of projects, the key part is the synthesis phase where you're looking for themes and patterns emerging from the research, or you're looking for a single aha, you know, thinking about that Swiffer story, that one moment where somebody wiped up with a paper towel that last bit of dust. Sometimes a single aha is fine from a qualitative framework because you're looking for inspiration. When we synthesized it, let me tell you what we found out. Here are some images of actually the storage, right? Where this container lived, if you will. Again, thinking empathetically about the container, a day in its life, where it lived. And we found something really interesting. We found that when the container is stored, either in a drawer or in a cupboard, it doesn't get used. So sad, lots of kind of disappointing emotions wrapped up in that, but it doesn't get used, it gets forgotten. Empathy for the container. When it's visible, it gets used. It has value in its, its owner's life, if you will. So that leads to this big aha of, wow, if we want our instant coffee to be used, it has to be visible and present. We don't want it tucked away. So what's the next step for that? I'll show you some ideation around how to design for visible storage. So once we have that kind of moment of inspiration, which is really you know, wow, we don't want it hidden. We want it out of the cupboard. Then we know we need to design differently. We need to then figure out what we can do to make it appealing to leave out. So that's where we come with an iterative learning sprint, right? We've had our bit of discovery. We've gained some kind of um, aha inspiration. And then we can go back to consumers online and do some ideation. What are their ideas? Maybe we can crowdsource a little bit to have people on the platform vote up the ideas that other people are sharing. We can also put forth our own ideas, but really what we want to do is leverage some of their ideation and some of our ideation. So again, we can get that iterative feedback as we're proceeding with the research. Let me share another example of, again, some, some work that we did recently where we're trying to build knowledge at the fuzzy front end. So Dave's Killer Bread, I can tell you, it's an American company. They're out in Oregon, and they make this organic whole grain bread. If you're not familiar with the brand, it's a really great brand story. I'm proud to be working with them, so I'm proud to share a little bit. Um, they were founded in 2005 by Dave Dahl, and he learned the baking trade growing up in his family business. The company has had steady growth. They have a great story, and um, they've expanded from 30 employees. That was in 2005 when they first started to 190 in 2010, 280 in 2012, and in 2015 they were purchased by Flowers Foods for seven. I mean, for 275 million dollars. It's a great brand story. So they're ripe for innovation at this point. So what we did with them is something called uh, brand fingerprinting, where we're identifying what makes a brand authentically that brand. We can't lose that. They have this valuable sort of heritage um, in, their, in how they started out. And they don't want to lose that as they grow. So we wanted to really identify with them, very collaborative co-creation effort, those things that we would need to make sure shape the future innovation efforts that they go through. So sensory cues needed for future product development, subconscious emotional cues that we can wrap into for future communications and even positions, positionings, and even moments, moments to target, occasions of use, if you will. We pull all these things together with different components to make sure that the fingerprint, which is unique to the brand, is understood by cross-functional teams and can really set the foundation for everything that they're doing in the future. Let me show you what the methodology looks like. We start with this knowledge transfer. So going back to what Dave was saying, um, you know, one of the things we really need to do with the fuzzy front end is really build that knowledge. So sometimes there's internal knowledge that needs to be shared. So we made sure that we all understood what was the existing research, 
what is sort of the brand story. They actually called it Dave's Killebred DKB 101, where anybody who works on that brand gets to know a little bit about it. And we layered in some methodology, social media research, for instance. We, we went to find out what the conversation was happening around them already about the brand, what was sort of out of their control in the public eye. Iteratively, we learned from the social media research that we did and layered that into some qualitative work that we did. We called it qualitative laddering. We spent a lot of time laddering up to higher end benefits, lying de laddering down to product cues. So we did a whole lot of laddering with some qualitative depth interviews. And we took iteratively the learning from that and put it into some quantitative research. So we have all of this knowledge gaining and knowledge disseminating happening before we took it into a brainstorming session where step one was really sharing what we learned, sharing insights, sharing uh, knowledge from the team. Everybody on a cross-functional team uh, has some real diversity of thinking and, and diversity of reflection that we can leverage when we get together as a group. So we did a lot of activities there. We had some pre-work with incubation exercises and lots of brainstorming. And real quick, when I say brainstorming, I just want to make it clear that we're talking about the intended um, uh, definition of brainstorming, if you will. You know, back in the day when Alex Osborne, the, he's the O in BBDO, for instance, coined the phrase brainstorming to be the, the balance of divergent thinking and convergent thinking, where you go broad and blue sky with freedom because you know that you will bring in some constraints and the, some decisiveness when you establish criteria and vote on ideas. So it's this um, dynamic balance of divergent thinking where you're going broad and then convergent thinking where you're coming back in. So a brainstorm session is most successful when you make sure that at the end of the day, you don't just have willy-nilly ideas everywhere, but you have very strategically selected ideas that have started to take some shape that can be further developed in an implementation plan. So during that session, we create a brand fingerprint where we've outlined everything that we talked about that can come together, and we identify next steps for the brand to dig into. If we move to the next slide, I'll show you what we do when we take that knowledge transfer and we apply some imagination to it and we get inspired, then sort of we know what's coming next is the idea that empowered with that brand fingerprint, we can explore those adjacent categories, where else they might want to extend into. We can explore any other kind of disruptive innovations that they may want to come up with, but it becomes iterative learning, another sprint, if you will, where we take all of that um, all of that background and we design the next, you know, sprint of research, if you will. In this case, a lot of online immersion with consumers to explore new categories. So you'll see kind of in wrapping up, there's that agile method that's sort of taking over uh, in terms of our research methodologies where we're looking for the, the discovery phase, we're looking to, to learn, to build knowledge, we're looking to be inspired through either momentary ahas or insights pulled from findings, we're looking to take some action, whether it's develop a concept that we can put back in front of clients, I mean in front of consumers, or we're looking to uh, create some ideas that participants can react to online, we're looking for anything that we can do before we bring it to the next iterative test. And we talked about two case studies, one which was really a category and uh, looking at the, the journey, the moments in the life of an instant coffee package, and also Dave's Killer Bread, what they're doing to establish a foundation at the fuzzy front end before future innovation efforts. Yeah, the, if I may add to this, so, so the key to successful inter innovation is to get the front end right, because at the front end really – is the point where you as a team gain focus. You're able to focus on what are the biggest and best moments of opportunity for your brand or for the initiative. Maybe there's even not even a brand yet, but it's, it's understanding what are these moments of opportunity and then also setting you up for the next iterative learning sprint which we'll get into um, in our next part two, uh, we'll be talking more about the processes of translation and co-design, which is really important uh, to be able to, to translate ideas 
into tangible concepts and prototypes that really signal the promise of the brand, signal the con you know, what is it that conceptually you're trying to design into something that's tangible and uh, where people will then see that brand, see that packaging, and instantly, intuitively know what it is all about and what it will do to fulfill their lives in mo those moments that you've identified as the biggest moments of opportunity. So at this point, we are ready to taking some questions. Um, I do know mm -hmm. one thing is that there was a question that was provided here in a, just a little bit ago um, uh, where, where uh, it's, you know, some people in a, uh, I guess, a group that were viewing this were wondering, you know, some people had to step out to go to another meeting. They wanted to know, um, you know, if there would be, uh, these slides would be available afterwards. Well, in fact, this whole um, presentation will be uh, provided in a video that you can then um, download. So you just have to, reg if you're not, re all of you here are registered that are currently listening. Mm -hmm. But if somebody else who was unable to attend wanted to see these slides, then you could just get on our website and go to um, a registration like you did for this webinar, and you will be able then to view uh, this in its entirety. So that said, um, are there any other questions? Just please, where it says questions, you can go in and you can type them now. And um, Karen and I are, are more than happy to, to be able to address those questions that you may have. And just procedurally, Dave, they'll all come to you since I am in participant mode, not presenter mode. So okay. fire away anything you want me to answer. <laughs> yep, yep. And you can say, I'll have, uh, you know, so, um, so uh, okay, I see one coming in here right now. And this one was is about um, um, online ethnography. How do we capture this information at various moments in home, in car, or on the soccer field, or so on and so forth. So yeah, all right, I'll take it because it's online call related. So with with you know with with any online project, we can actually use the technology to go out there. So people, there's great platforms now that allow us to be. Um, with participants wherever they may be. So they don't necessarily need to be uh, down in their homes per se. They can be out there in the world and we can be doing it using mobile devices. So that's one of the great precepts of online qual. And what's great about that is since we focus so much on journeys and routines and habits, uh, we want people to be out there doing things that are along their journey or in their routine and uh, sort of in their habitual activities of the day. So we can layer in journaling and storytelling and photo and video uploads regardless of where people are People are using online ethnography. Um, and, and, you know, the, the best part about that is that clients can be looking at whatever people are doing kind of by being observers in a virtual back room, if you will. So I hope that answers your question. Hopefully they'll type back in and say, yes, they've got it. Um, but the idea is that you don't need to be there in person and you can be wherever people are, whether it's on the soccer field or <laughs> or on, on their boat <laughs> or in the store. Right. Okay, another question here is, uh, what do you think about using product reviews on Amazon for ideas for innovation? I, I, this is it's a great question um, because Amazon or other sort of social media is a very good way to gain input into products uh, that people are willing to chat about or willing to post reviews about. Not all products, of course, are relevant to that, such as personal care products, but products that have some sort of social share out uh, certainly do. Um, you know, f many food products definitely uh, today have a share out sort of quality to them, uh, uh, either positive or negatively. Um, things that are functional, often will have good share out qualities things that are social um you know everything from 
uh, things that are more about um, like uh, alcoholic beverages or, or various things that people would share. You know, I think of uh, kids' products a lot, you know, very social, very things that, that people will chat about, socialize about. You know, you can gain a huge wealth of information about things uh, through social media research, you know, scraping. Uh, we've done this on a number of times, you know, scraping various different content from sources and then analyze that. There's some great tools to help uh, to qualitatively and quantitatively to understand what's going on. Now, you have to be careful that you don't uh, take social media information and say this is representative of what is going on behaviorally in the market space, because people that are uh, that will talk about some things uh, may not. We did a piece of research some years ago, I recall, on on uh, meal replacement behaviors, and there was this really interesting uh, number of people that were talking about eating food in bed, <laughs> which conjures up all sorts of interesting uh, imagery. But um, we found out that if when we quantitated this through quanti quantitative research techniques, you know, this is a teeny, 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 tiny sort of um, mm. segment in the marketplace. But there was uh, a lot more chatting about this that for whatever reason people felt they had to share. <laughs> so, so anyways, mm. um, the last thing, just to emphasize that um, – when you look at product reviews, you're, again, you're focusing on product white space, potentially. And at the front end of innovation, what you want to do is focus on behavioral white space. So those moments, uh, not the products necessarily, but those moments, because you, we have found time and time again, is when you look at that, often it's even products in different different categories that are competitive to the product you're thinking about bringing to market. So it's that innovative way, you know, if people have a tool they're seeking, it may not be the tool that you think. It may not be the product that you think. So if you look at it strictly from product white space for an existing category and look for space there, you will often miss the opportunity. And, but if you use the lens of looking at moments, moments of opportunities, and the, then, then think about, okay, now that we know, I zeroed in on moments of opportunity, focus in on what ideas can use to actually create value in the world for consumers in those moments. All right, I got another one here. Uh, let's see. Um, okay. Um, that's it, I guess, for all the uh, relevant sent to all sort of uh, things. Um, there's a few other sort of questions that various individuals um, uh, wanted to talk to us privately on. But so, so again, if if there's a, another question that you may have at a different point. You may think about, um, you know, uh, past this point, then, you know, we're really happy to to um, dialogue with you or help you through that. Also, remember, this is a two-part webinar series. The second part will be held on April the 5th, and the title of that and the focus of that will be on translation through iterative design. And it's, it's trying to address that one of those four buckets of challenges that cons that uh, that professionals that are involved with innovation are finding, and that is, you know, you know, I, great ideas, great concepts lost in translation. How do you f ensure that you translate correctly? Okay, so uh, if there's nothing else at this point, thank everybody for attending this next session of webinars now and we look forward to next month um, you know if you find other people that may be interested in this please do ask them to join us and um, we'll have a, a great dialogue and and hopefully uh, generate some some collective learning here
And our email addresses are on this slide. So if you want to reach out with additional questions to either one of us, please feel free. Don't hesitate. Uh, you know, both Dave and I would be happy to answer any of the questions that you have. Great. Okay. Everyone have a great day. Thanks. Thanks a bunch. Bye.